continuing with Mr. Mark Moriel. Great to be back with you. Thank you. Welcome. We are being observed also today by Mildred Antenor and Nikolai Bergeller, videographer, Sean Wilson, the interviewer. We'll uh, one pick up. sensational team. <laughs> uh, Picking a up where we plus left off. Emmy, Oscar, award well, winning thank you, team. Sir. So you, you were going to talk to me about your companies. You were practicing law. You said that you realized that you functioned better in a leadership role than working at the law yeah, firm. I other started, than I actually, them. Yeah, I actually started my little first, it's really the second, third business I started uh, coming out of law school and it was a hat and t-shirt specialty business. and. Uh, these t-shirts have always been a hot item and uh, I bid on a contract to do uh, license caps for the 1984 New Orleans World's Fair. They selected three or four contractors and I was picked as one. Uh, little did I know at the time that the license they gave me didn't authorize me to sell the caps on site. Uh, that I had to go market them to sh uh, shops and stores mainly in the French Quarter. Uh, in, uh, in other places in the city. But it was a great experience. Uh, I found a partner who was in effect a supplier. Uh, we worked together and, uh, and that led to the opportunity to do business with the United States Football League team, the New Orleans Breakers, and, uh, and uh, a number of political candidates and small businesses and others. So I worked, basically it was a very small business. I had one employee one full-time employee and uh, operated out of a small warehouse in the French Quarter section of the city uh, and uh, business probably for about two to three years uh, we did business and uh, probably didn't make much money but it was a great experience of being an entrepreneur and I was doing that while at the same time holding a full-time job at a downtown law firm so I'd leave the firm around 6.37 in the evening and go over to my business uh, and, uh, and, uh, and do work there. So it was, you know, it was fun. It was a chance to be in charge. It was a chance to kind of pursue a dream. What was your father doing at the time? My father was a mayor at the time. I just returned back home from Georgetown University uh, Law School. And uh, I was working for a law firm called Barham and Churchill. Interestingly, just last week, the founding partner, Mac Barham, died. Just found out today uh, through a phone call my brother, from my brother that uh, he, had, he had passed. He was a great, great man. I had a chance to work with him at the firm he founded. He was a retired justice of the Louisiana Supreme Court. But you know, there's nothing like owning your own business. There's nothing like entrepreneurship. There's nothing like sort of being able to create uh, and, and, and that sense of independence. But you learn, I learned at least, you know, in my business experiences that my small business experience is, is that it is a tremendous amount of work uh, and you can't delegate it to anybody else. You've got to do it yourself. So from the law firm, um, we spoke about the law firm quite, and we're going to move forward to 1986. Mm -hmm. And I, I left the law firm, I, I don't know if I talked about when I left the law firm. I left the law firm in 1985. I spent almost two years there. I had a great opportunity while I was there to uh, argue a major case before the Louisiana Supreme Court. I was 26 years of age, 27 uh, exactly, and argued a major criminal law case, State versus Shropshire, which doesn't mean anything if you're not from Louisiana as much, but it's a, it's a case which made police records public records and thus available to the public and to newspapers and also to those who were accused of crimes. Uh, and uh, it was a great experience to argue a case that no one thought uh, I could win, uh, least of all people in the law firm I was with, uh, and able to win the case and, and basically uh, have a big victory as a very young lawyer. Uh, it, was a, it was a very important part of my early career. And your father was still mayor at this time? I guess he was still mayor at this time, yeah. Now, did he, what input was he having? I mean, my father's uh, role modeling uh, uh, and uh, expectations for achievement, but I never really was directed to go into law, never really directed to uh, 
go into public service. Uh, you know, it was very interesting. I think expectations were set to achieve and to accomplish. And something about public service and the things I did was just instilled in me as a young, as a young boy. And it stayed with me, but I was never pushed. And it's interesting, I was allowed to make my own decisions. So when you took the case, what made you think you could win? I just fighting. felt a sense of that it was, uh, you know, I took the case not knowing that this sort of ancillary evidentiary issue would be a part of the case. No idea that, you know, and I think I went to go investigate the case and I said, well, I need to get these police reports and these police records. And you know, these are confidential. I said, you mean the, the report that the police drew up when they arrested my client? That that's confidential? I said, well, how do I know when the police officer or when the people who are uh, testifying against my client get on the stand, whether they told the police officer the same thing at the time of the arrest? Well, I challenged it. You know, I challenged it, lost at the trial court. Then I went and filed a civil lawsuit and won the civil lawsuit. And then I had a conflict between a criminal law, criminal court, criminal court, a criminal judge's ruling and a civil judge's ruling. I went to the Court of Appeal and lost there, went to the Supreme Court and won seven to zero. So it was, uh, I just felt it was an unfair practice. Do you think race had anything to do with it? You know, I don't know if race had anything to do with this case, quite frankly. I think the idea that... I mean, the conduct or, or just the, the fact that you, the, police reports are mm, confidential. Honestly, I don't think don't it really think so. had anything okay. to do with that. had anything to do with race. I think it had to do with the fact they were just... They had all, that had been the history, and the idea would be was a sort of a pro-law enforcement approach. And I argued before the court, interestingly, that if police reports were public, it would promote plea bargains. Because if a defendant knew, if an accused person knew what evidence that police had on them. See, before the police reports were public, it was almost a shot in the dark. You don't know what anybody's going to say. Well, that's not the theory. That's not the American system of justice. The American system of justice is that a trial is not supposed to be a surprise. It's supposed to be a fair sort of presentation and debate over facts in a search for the truth, which leads to a quest for justice. So you left the law firm. After left that the law case. firm and uh, in '85 started my own little practice. What was the name of your practice? It was just uh, Mark Moriel, attorney at law. <laughs> Did you hang a shingle out? Hang a shingle out. I, I rented space at the Liberty Bank Building on South Pier Street, and then later moved uh, to One Porges Plaza. And what type of law were you? I practice. I had a general practice. My first client. Uh, was Dollar Rent-A-Car, which was an African-American owned rent-a-car franchisee. And the, uh, the uh, man who owned it also owned the radio station in town. What was his name? His name was Tom Lewis and Jim Hutchinson. And they, got, they asked me to help them. It started out uh, really just notarizing some papers. And then it turned into assisting them in a wide range of issues. It was a business client, you know, and it was a, it was exciting. And I had a uh, dollar rent a car and I eventually was able to hook up with uh, Vern Keeler, V Keeler and, and Company, which was basically a big, uh, large minority, uh, heavy and highway construction firm. And I had, I had a very general practice and I did tort work and criminal defense work. It was a very traditional, let me hang up my shingle and let me basically take whatever comes to the door. So, so I learned a lot and it was fun and at the beginning I didn't make a lot of money. Just pay my bills and uh, keep things moving. How many uh, African American lawyers would you say were in New Orleans at the time? It was a grow in the 80s it was a growing number. It was a growing number. Uh, it was a growing number uh, and at the time the judiciary was changing. When I got out of law school there was only one black trial judge at the state level in, Louisiana, in, in New Orleans. One, only one, uh, Judge Revius Ortique, who uh, became a mentor of mine. Uh, when I... Uh, How do you spell his name? O-R-T-I-Q-U-E. 
Revius Ortique. When I left, uh, after serving eight years in mayor, as mayor, which is 19 years after I finished law school, the, uh, the trial bench, the trial courts in New Orleans were majority African American. So they went from virtually being all white which was not reflective of the city, because at the time the city was 40, 45 percent black, to being a majority black judiciary. Uh, when I started uh, in 1983, started my law business, there was only one woman trial judge in the city. Uh, by the time 2002 came, I bet the, maybe a third of the judges were women. So I got an opportunity during the time I, to witness the transformation of the judiciary. Uh, and, what and would you say were the catalysts for that to happen? The African American voters, because we had elected judges. And uh, the fact that you had a growing number of African American lawyers who uh, were prepared to, and well qualified to be judges and the fact that there were voters to vote them in. So as your business is growing, uh, at some point in 86, you decide to run for office? No, I didn't run for office until, until 1990. Until and, between that, and, and some of the significant well, things I got involved. I mean, I guess you were a member, a board member of Louisiana, yeah. American Civil Liberties. I, got, I was involved in all kinds of stuff. I was on the Boys and Girls Club, uh, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters of New Orleans. I was involved in the Louisiana American Civil Liberties Union. I led the Stop Bork Coalition, uh, where we were trying to stop uh, uh, Robert Bork from becoming a Supreme Court Justice. We had a Louisiana coalition for that. Uh, I uh, had an opportunity to become general counsel of an organization called the Louisiana Voter Registration Education Crusade, which was a nonprofit voter registration organization. Uh, we got involved in some very interesting litigation. One was a case I handled to stop the voter purges of 1986 and 1987, where there was an effort to basically clean up the voting rolls by doing an address check and knocking off all these African Americans. So we went to court, federal and state court, and challenged those purges and challenged that. I got involved as the chair of the plaintiffs committee in a Supreme Court a case that eventually went to the United States Supreme Court called Chisholm versus Romer which led to the uh, election of the first Supreme Court justice uh, in Louisiana state history. So I got involved in a whole variety of things. I got involved in things that were important uh, to me. I got involved, I was inspired. Uh, my father was a great civil rights lawyer in his day. I was inspired to uh, do civil rights work as a part of my practice. I got involved uh, as the general counsel for the Louisiana Association of Minority Women and Women-Owned Businesses. I was the general counsel for the New Orleans Association of Independent Taxi Cab Drivers. Now mind you, a lot of these organizations, you were functioning as a general counsel, as a bit of a strategic advisor. I mean, they might have paid you $250 a month, $500 a month. You were not doing it because it was handsomely paid, especially relative to the amount of time they wanted. But it was part of my civic engagement, and it was a way I built my practice because I got a chance to meet so many people and network with so many people in my uh, position in, in, with those sorts of uh, uh, organizations. Uh, so did those organizations then become beneficial for you when it was time for you to run? I think they were. I think I, I met so many interesting, dynamic uh, community leaders. I mean, I, you know, uh, the New Orleans Independent Taxi Cab Drivers Association must have had 500 members. Uh, Louisiana Association of Minority Women-Owned Businesses had hundreds of members. I mean, this was a time of, you know, organizational engagement, uh, and uh, I uh, had an opportunity in my practice to do a lot of that, to get involved in some significant cases, while at the same time just trying to build a, uh, a living. I mean, I remember I was, it was, I was proud when in 1986, I got an office in One Porges Plaza on the 16th floor, man. I was downtown. I had just arrived. And I guess it was a proud time because my father, who had practiced law, had an office in the neighborhood. He had an office in what was then in the 1950s and 60s, the black professional building in New Orleans, the Knights of Peter Claver building. And so for the idea 
I remember in 1986, there were very few African-American lawyers who had their own offices downtown. Uh, and I had that, and uh, it was a, you know, I thought it was a significant accomplishment. You know, when you look back on it, you basically, you know, just practicing law on the, on the 16th floor. Uh, but it was good because it was close to the courthouse, close to City Hall. When did you start eyeing uh, political offices? Well, you know, oh, I... Where did the idea come from? One thing I, I may not have mentioned is in 1984, uh, uh, Jesse Jackson We, we for, talked about you when you worked for Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson, and I think I was always involved in my father's elections, uh, particularly his 77 election and to some extent his 1982 election and then Jesse's election. So I had run for, and I was a delegate to the Democratic National Convention in 84, in 88, in 92, 96. In 2000, 2004 was the first time uh, I've not been a delegate to the Democratic Convention uh, almost since I've been a voter. So, so, what doors would you say Jesse opened up for you, having worked for him? I think Jesse opened up doors to a great network. Uh, Donna Brazil, who, although she's from New Orleans, Mignon Moore, uh, Yolanda Carraway, uh, uh, I can name so many people that, uh, that I had an opportunity to meet that are still allies and colleagues and friends to this day through Jesse Jackson. I mean, we all joke, you know, we were all kids. We were all young. You know, we we're out there with Jesse. And the campaign was a crusade. It was a cause. And uh, uh, not only did I meet a lot of people, I think it was great, uh, a great primer on national politics. So. An inside look, uh, because a national campaign is, in effect, a collection of different campaigns. A national campaign is also a, uh, a chance to deal with the tough issues, the biggest issues, life, death, war, life and death, war and taxes. National campaigns are played out on a philosophical camp stage, sometimes in a way that local campaigns, which are about sometimes crime and jobs and trash, and personality are, si are simply not in many cases. So, you know, having been a delegate in 84 and 88 for Jesse and his historic runs, I had always, uh, and when I was in law school, I worked for Mickey Leland, I don't know if I mentioned that. I always, I had my eye uh, on running for Congress. And I always figured I'd go back to Louisiana. Robert Drinan, Father Robert Drinan, who uh, was a member of Congress in the 70s, uh, and a Jesuit priest, and a law professor of mine at Georgetown. I remember him saying, when I went to go see him before I left to go back to Louisiana, he said, you go back to Louisiana, you go run for Congress. I'll see you back up here in a couple of years. Well, I ended up running for Congress in 1990. It was uh, a historic opportunity because the seat in New Orleans, uh, second congressional district, had been held by the Boggs family, by Hale Boggs and then by his wife, Lindy Boggs, for almost 50 years, one family had held the seat. And the seat opened up. Uh, Lindy Boggs uh, decided to retire, but uh, I began to make noises as though I was going to run early in 1990. Uh, and eventually she retired about a week before uh, qualifying took place, and I qualified to run for. Uh, Congress in a race where there were 11 or 12 candidates. Busy field. I eventually, I was the youngest candidate. How old were you? 32. And uh, got out there and ran, uh, made the runoff, got into the second primary in a very, very close election. And in the second primary, I lost very narrowly to the current holder of the seat, William Jefferson who at the time was 11 or 12 years older than me, who at the time was the president of the, uh, chairman rather, of the Louisiana Legislative Black Caucus. He was a very powerful U.S. Senator. And I know I gave him a race that he never forgot, uh, and a race that he was the favorite and I was the underdog. But nonetheless, I wasn't successful. But it was a tough loss because it was Sometimes these close 
to say. Somebody wants to see it. Picking it up, and we're just going to put him into the timeline because this Look, happens in 1989. It happened in 91, actually, 91, in 1991. And, and in fact, I ran for the Senate. So I run for Congress. Let me just go back to that. I run for Congress, and it's an exciting race, and it's a great race, and it's a fun race, and I have a grassroots campaign, and, and uh, we just don't quite make it, but we run a very, very energetic campaign I remain proud of today because we had an incredible grassroots coalition. And just you were going to name those people that were important in that oh, campaign. Oh, I had Angel Wilson in that campaign. I'm trying to remember. Well, who else worked in that came in the campaign? Vincent Sylvain, Ed Murray, Joe Givens, uh, Sandra Gunner, uh, Bob Tucker, Jimmy Fitzmaurice. Had a great collection of people who were so helpful to me at that early stage of my career. And then so many grassroots, you know, soldiers who were involved in that campaign. And so we ran, made the runoff, uh, defeated to get to the runoff some very prominent uh, people who didn't make it, State Senator John Johnson, school board member Woody Koppel, now Judge Michael Bagnaris, uh, a whole host of very, very good candidates who ran for that race. But it was a historic race because it was the first time the seat had really been open in 50 years. And it was also the first chance that Louisiana had to elect an African American to Congress since Reconstruction. And uh, our theme was Morial for Congress and our future. And we ran basically trying to focus on the idea that I was trying to overcome the fact that I was 32 and everyone else who was running was probably in their 40s and older. I was trying to create a thematic by saying that it was important to elect a young person to Congress so they'd have time to generate seniority and thus have power on behalf of the city and on behalf of the state. Uh, Looking back, do you think that was a good strategy to run on? Yeah, I do. I think it was, it was a strategy available to me, and I was trying to create a contrast between an older person who obviously had more, quote, political experience in me, and, 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 and my candidacy as a hope for the future. And I'll never forget uh, I announced my candidacy at Gallier Hall and had, uh, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of people there. It was enthusiastic, it was energetic. Um, we had our campaign headquarters at 1441 North Broad Street. We, uh, uh, it was a campaign with a lot of support from the ministerial community, uh, a lot of grassroots support, but it was, it was an uphill campaign. Because when you run sort of as an underdog and a little bit of an upstart, I mean, I had Great name recognition because of my family name and because of my father. At this time, my father had passed, so it wasn't as though I was running with his support or in his shadow, but certainly with the family legacy. And uh, running with someone who had been sort of a, a community leader uh, and a community activist lawyer. Uh, and I, I learned so much in that campaign, and in fact, I built the political base and the name recognition that pretty much carried me through my next two races. Uh, after uh, we were not successful, uh, I have really had no immediate plans to run for office again. And opportunity knocked in the form of a new state senate seat with no incumbent that I uh, was located in, th that I lived in, that had about 55 percent African American, about 45 percent white white constituency. And uh, I ran that race. It was a very different kind of race because I had run in an entire congressional district, you know, with five to six hundred thousand people. Now I was running uh, in a small Senate seat that had about a hundred thousand voters in it. Ran a very grassroots campaign. I remember what we used to do every Saturday morning. We'd get all our volunteers together with clipboards and basically these little slips and we went out knocking door to door in all the neighborhoods in the district. The seventh ward was in the district, uh, parts of the sixth ward, parts of the fifth ward, uh, public housing development, St. Bernard, Lafitte, uh, Iberville, and uh, the Gust High Rise, uh, 
lot of areas that I had carried in the race for Congress. So we'd get out there and we'd knock on doors and Saturday morning and uh, basically collect locations for lawn signs. And then in the afternoon, we'd go back out and put them all up. So we pretty much lit up the district. And uh, I was running against, at that time, a candidate who, you know, has, has become a friend to this day. He's now a judge, uh, a guy named Kern Reese and another guy named Nick Varecchio and another woman who, so the four candidates, and I was able to win against those three candidates without the necessity of a runoff. Got 51% of the vote, and I remember the night of the election, we didn't know that we had won without a runoff until the final precinct came in. And we just avoided the necessity of a runoff by 300 votes. Uh, it was uh, a good victory because the, my primary opponent was being supported by City Hall, the then mayor at the time, and all of his forces. He outspent me three to one, had a tremendous amount of, uh, of television. And uh, I remember I was just struggling and eking out dollars. And at the very end, we got enough money to do a little television buy of $25,000. Did a little commercial. I remember we shot it in my mother's backyard. Just me standing in front of the camera, almost saying, please vote for me. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a great race. I mean, and what year was But that? you know, it was a time, George Bush, for both my congressional race, and this is pre-Clinton. And uh, at the time, the issues in my, in my, in, in my uh, Senate race was really the issue of public safety and crime. We had a horrible murder rate emerging in New Orleans, a crime rate. So those were big issues, you know, in that campaign. So how, where does David Duke fit Now, when this? I'm running for the Senate. And this is 19? Both times I ran in 1990 and in 1991, David Duke was running. David Duke in 1990 was running. While I was running for Congress, he was running for the United States Senate against Senator Jay Bennett Johnson. When I was running for the Senate in 1991, he was running for governor. So in 1990, one of the effects of Duke was it allowed us to create a cause around the election. In other words, we could rally people against Duke. So we had record turnout with people coming out to vote against Duke. Of course, his supporters voting for him, but against Duke. So the Duke factor was a factor in both of my elections in terms of stimulating uh, the electorate uh, to turn out and vote. Uh, in 90, he lost, made the runoff for the United States Senate. Here's the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan making the runoff for the United States Senate against a very good, competent, hardworking U.S. Senator named J. Bennett Johnston who had been there 20 years and who had delivered buckets of money for the state. And then the following year, Duke loses and then he runs for governor, makes the runoff again. This time in a runoff against Edwin Edwards and Edwin Edwards trounces him, but Duke still carries a majority of the African American, a majority of the white, of white vote statewide, slightly, and in New Orleans too. So uh, I remember seeing Duke the night of my election to the Senate. Uh, I was going to the television station, Channel 4, to give an interview, and uh, almost literally ran smack into Duke, coming in, going out of the station. Uh, so it was an interesting thing. You know, you wonder when people look back and say, how did he do it? And what David Duke did is David Duke was a, was a skillful demagogue. He made welfare recipients and the welfare system the primary issue in his rhetorical campaign by telling people that the welfare system was the reason for the problems in Louisiana and in America. That if you, if you did something about all, all these welfare recipients, then you get away with all, you, you solve all economic, educational, and social problems. It was demagoguery. And I think we were stunned at how well he was able to do with that campaign. We're going to pause here and change the tapes. Okay. Let's get my little snack.
Uh, okay, so continuing. David you asked me if David Duke, if I learned anything. David Duke couldn't teach anybody anything but how to hate. He couldn't teach anybody anything but how to divide. Uh, he was a, just a low down, you know, despicable presence on the political scene because his aim was to divide. His aim was to spew hate. And uh, it was embarrassing to me as a Louisianian that someone like that could do as well as they, as they did uh, in an election contest, particularly a high-profile election contest. So what do you think that says about Louisiana? I think it says you can fool a lot of people some of the time. I think it, it demonstrates that hate can sell, demagoguery can sell, division can sell, which is why when people spew that, they've got to be challenged on the spot. There can be no, 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 no let up in challenging Duke and people like him in terms of what he represents. So moving along, you, uh, it's what year is it, 1991, 92. I, you know, I got elected to the legislature in 1991, elected to the Senate and took over in 1992. It was an interesting time. We had a record number of black members in the legislature because of reapportionment. I think we had 32. Edwin Edwards was coming in as the uh, governor uh, again. Uh, casino gambling was uh, a hot issue in the legislature. Uh, it was an interesting time. I spent two years in the legislature. and I guess uh, I got there and I just I proposed a lot of legislation. But this wasn't necessarily new for you because you'd visit, I mean, you hung out there. I'd spent a lot, yeah, right. I mean, I'd spent a lot of time so around the legislature. And I had a sense of how it worked, and it was, it, it allowed me to go there and have an impact pretty immediately. It wasn't, I was a rookie who wasn't a rookie. So you received a Rookie of the Year? Rookie of the Year Award, which is given by the Capitol Press Corps, and also the, uh, Education Senator of the Year, which was given by the Louisiana Association of Educators. And what do you think you did to deserve that? I had a bill. Uh, basically, I was very consistent and vocal in supporting full funding for education and equity in education funding. Secondly, I had a, a bill, which didn't pass, but was a great bill, to authorize high school principals to be registrars of voters. This is prior to, in Louisiana, you couldn't until 1993 registered to vote through the mail. You had to personally go to the courthouse and fill out the papers, personally. Or every once in a while the registrar would have a drive at a shopping center or in the, in the community. So I said, well, why don't we just let high school principals become deaf so they can register people in the office? Why don't we let college you know, deans and counselors? And I think it was a bill that the education community liked and it wasn't successful, but it generated a fair amount of media. Uh, the bill was not successful? No, the bill was not successful. It was not successful. You know, the reactionary interest in the legislature said they started waving the flag of fraud. Fraud. Some high school principals might commit fraud. Register people who aren't old enough. You know, fear sells. And uh, it gave those that didn't want to vote for it an excuse to say no. Also, conservationist. Yeah, I... Uh, had a chance when I was in the Senate to be to serve on the Committee on Environmental Quality, which was a brand new committee. I also got an opportunity to serve as vice chair of the committee. And the chair of the committee was a veteran senator who, uh, if we could say, didn't really want to be chair of the Environmental Quality Committee. He wanted to be chair of another committee, but he ended up with the committee. And so sometimes he, he was on a committee that met at the same time. I would be left to chair the meeting. So I got a chance probably about half the time my first two years to actually chair the Senate Committee on Environmental Quality. And uh, you know, in those days, uh, a lot of special interests, oil companies and timber companies and paper companies, and they control these committees. And I was probably a little bit of a thorn in their side. But I was a thorn in their side. I mean, I, my, my strategy was to amend, try to amend bills. Couldn't stop them. 
And it was, it was great because I was put in a position of getting an opportunity to negotiate with a lot of these folks and with a lot of these interests. So I think that is why you know, there were not too many people in the legislature in those days who openly said, I'm an environmental champion. And I was probably one of the few. And uh, so the Sierra Club gave me a nice award. So at that time, did you recognize any problems with this, the city, I mean, with the levees and... You know, I have to be honest, I think people fundamentally trusted the idea that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had built good levees. I mean, because after Hurricane Betsy, during Betsy the levees were non-existent in many areas and very low in a lot of areas. So after Hurricane Betsy, there was a process of raising the levees. I don't think anyone thought about the strength of the levees. In fact, a lot of the levees that broke had been raised. So you see the levee going up, you don't think as a, as a layperson, as a civilian, that hmm, maybe that levee's not strong enough. No matter how high it is, if it falls, it falls. Uh, what was an issue, but not a big issue back then, was there was always concern about the wetlands and about the erosion of the marsh in southeastern Louisiana. But in those days, a lot of people scoffed at people who were concerned about the marsh, suggesting that that was a fringe issue, that it didn't have anything to do with flood protection, hurricane protection, or anything of that sort. Uh, so I had two years and a little bit more in the Senate. And uh, after my second year in the Senate, uh, I started entertaining thoughts of running for mayor. And it's funny because I, I sort of vowed at the time that I didn't want to run for mayor, that I was going to stay in the Senate because I like the Senate. Really being in the Senate is probably the single uh, best political job I ever had. I mean, I enjoyed being mayor. It, it trumps everything, but the Senate was a place where you had colleagues. The Senate was a place of collegiality. The Senate was a place in those days where we could get something done. The Senate was a place where we had a nice coalition. Uh, the Senate was a place uh, that I learned a lot. And, uh, you know, uh, then I decided. And, and it was, in effect, uh, who convinced you that you should run? I don't really know who convinced me. It's almost like it was spontaneous combustion. I was very peaked, upset, not happy about the direction of the city. Uh, crime had gotten out of control. There seemed to be just complete lethargy in the government. I went to a meeting in City Hall and it looked like they hadn't polished the floors, the bathrooms were dirty. You know, and you, you see these sorts of things and I think something went off in me and said, you know what, I can do a better job. The other thing is there were a number of people who were running for mayor. I call it, uh, it was four people running, five people running, all of them were 50 and over. And I was 35. And I'm, I sort of remember reading the paper, you know, and saying, you know, what are we going to get if any of these guys win? We get more to say. We get the same old things, no fire, no change, no nothing. And uh, I decided to run very late. I remember I announced my candidacy on November 10th, 1993. The filing deadline was December 1st. And uh, got out then and uh, just put the old grassroots Morial coalition together. And we stormed the barracks. And uh, it was, you know, I got in the race and several of the candidates, particularly some of the other African-American candidates, were cross with me, they were mad with me, why am I running? Why were they? Well, they were jealous because they knew that my presence in the race meant that they, uh, it made their job much more difficult. Uh, you know, I had a... How much did the legacy play into you running? I think the legacy played a lot into uh, the idea that at 35 and with two years in the Senate, I could be a credible candidate. I think that the brand name, the Morial name in New Orleans represents probably progressive, effective leadership, effective leadership, the idea of getting things done. 
making things happen, and the idea of strength, and the idea of, uh, you know, uh, multiracial coalitions. I think that's what the Morial political brand uh, represents in New Orleans. So you mount a campaign, I mean, you, a successful campaign, and you win. What, what's the, what was the biggest challenge in, from the day you said, okay, I'm going to run to actually... Got to do something about crime. I got to fix this police department. The police department was corrupt. The police department, uh, you had out of control murders and crime. We had drug problems and we had a dysfunction. I have to fix this. I've got to do something about this. I've got to get me a police chief. I've got to come up with a plan. And that was really the defining issue of my time in office. Uh, defining. A Is defi that how you ran the campaign? I ran on crime. To, ran on crime. Okay. Public safety, jobs, and housing. Same things. Uh, Public safety, housing, and jobs? Jobs. And. But they were all tied together. I tied them together. How so? Well, the crime problem, uh, we had an abandoned housing problem. I said these, cra these abandoned housing are havens for crack dealers. Uh, one of the reasons why the crime rate was high is because there were not enough jobs. Uh, we tied them together. Said that uh, the way to make our city safe was not just better police, but was a better criminal justice system. and good, solid, positive things for youth to do. So that was our theme. What were the other professional careers of the other general? They were mainly... The other that you were running against? You had one guy who was a city council member. You had one guy who was an elected tax assessor. You had another guy who was a state legislator. You had another guy who was a corporate lawyer. You had... Uh, those were the main candidates. And uh, one thing I remember, I think... Early in the campaign, this is one of the things that we had a, a debate at uh, Walter L. Cohen High School, all black high school. Go to debate, we have a debate, but after the debate, there's a mock election. You know, and like we're all there, so that all these kids are going to vote. I think we had the mock election, I think I got 75% of the votes in the mock election. And these guys were so upset. I mean, they were like just, you know, upset. And, you know, what happens in a, interesting in a campaign, particularly a local campaign, you literally debate every day. You go to candidates. So you'd see your opponents all the time. So, you know, you'd, they, so a lot of times you'd go to debate and they put you in a room together so, you know, it'd be like you and your opponents in a room. And so, you know, you kind of notice after a while some of these guys don't want to talk to you. You know, you're saying, you, you, you read this chemistry, you say, uh-oh, I must be winning. <laughs> I must be winning. <laughs> so when, when do politics play into your job? As, 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 I mean, as far as doing what you say you're going to do, I mean, when do you stop? I mean, do you know what I'm asking? I mean, Politics is a process. I mean, po the word politics has gotten a bad name. Politics is the art of democracy. That's what it is. It comes from the Greek word polis, polis, P-O-L-I-S, which really means uh, city. And it's the art of practicing democracy. And it gets a bad name because we think of it as only trading and making deals and making trade-offs. And that's always negotiating and compromising are always a part of democracy. However, I think, at least I viewed my career starting with a stand, starting with a position, starting with a vision, starting with some views. I didn't walk into situations very seldom without a stand, without a view, without a thought process about an issue. Whether it was the arts, whether it was animal protection, whether it was streets and neighborhood development, whether it was recreation, whether it was fire protection, whether it was public safety, whether it was hurricane protection, whether it was historic preservation. You walked in, I walked in with a, with a vision, with a view, with a stand, a uh, philosophical core. And, uh, but, but understanding that in the process of trying to move a ball 
mayor, an, an executive, has to work with a council, a legislative uh, arm. And, and that council, for me, was made up of seven people. I had to, in effect, put together four of seven votes on major initiatives. And that required, at times, give and take with members of the city council. But I think in eight years, we never lost a vote. Never lost a vote. Uh, in eight years, I had, a, I had a, for the most part, a generally supportive, pretty supportive city council. They uh, supported me. Uh, you know, well, we, what, what, what did, the, what did, what were the? You said crime, police, corruption, budget issues, crime issues, infrastructure. Tell you what we did. We had well, the first, my first big legislative package after being mayor was a public safety package. What did, what did it have in it? I had a curfew. I Let's had, talk about that curfew, because mm -hmm. it was pretty, I mean, it, you, you were asking that teenagers be home by 9 o'clock, was mm -hmm. it? Uh, and it was controversial. People thought you... It was somewhat controversial, although it's interesting because sometimes you do this when you make... But I remember before we did the curfew, I had an idea, I had a lot of things we wanted to do. I said, let's go do a public opinion poll before we announce it. Let's see how this community, because I was looking for, but it's important that the curfew got the publicity, but the summer jobs and the, and the summer camps and the after school programs is where we put the money. So this was a, 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 a tough love package. It wasn't me thinking, and the other thing is I de-stung the curfew by not arresting offenders. We picked them up, we brought them to a curfew center, and we called their parents to come pick them up. That's what we did. Well, where did that idea come from? Where, where, where? We're sitting around the table. We're sitting around the table in a, in a staff meeting, in a strategy meeting, and we're talking about this, and we said, okay, let's talk about this curfew. Who do you think? Well, how can we do it? Well, what are we gonna do? How do we do it? He said, what's the downside? Well, people don't want these kids to have records. I said, what can we do about that? He said, well, why, why do we have to take them to jail? Can we get another place and just take them? So things evolve. So, okay, good, that makes sense. So we got a curfew center. And we basically had people call the mamas, call the daddies, come get your child, we have your child here. Enormously successful. Uh, it was uh, highly, you know, very, very positive. And, uh, but, but it's important it was combined with a whole lot of other things. It wasn't by itself, it wasn't standing alone. And I, uh, also combined it with uh, a transfer of 200 police officers from desk jobs to the streets. I took all the police officers out of City Hall. I took all the police officers out of the court system. And I basically put sheriffs who were security guards in there because we had too many people, too many police officers in cushy jobs. 15, 20 police officers working in City Hall. For what? Didn't make any sense. Police are for public safety, not for building security. Um, so we had a package, and while at the same time we were looking for a chief of police, we conducted a national search. It took a long time. We ended up picking Richard Pennington, the current chief in Atlanta. He turned out to be an excellent chief, probably the best chief in New Orleans history. And uh, much to my regret and his regret after uh, we left office and Ray Nagin took over uh, with his police chief, uh, they pretty much dismantled all the progress we made. Uh, it didn't make any sense and the city paid for it. The city paid for it in, a, in an increased crime rate. It paid for it in many of the same problems that we had gotten rid of in the police department. So during your, your eight year tenure as mayor, what do you consider to be the successes, the, the greatest successes? The biggest, the biggest success, failures. I believe, is reducing crime by 60%, fixing a corrupt, broken down, raggedy, dysfunctional police department. Number two, changing the citizens' attitudes about the city from being negative to being positive. Third, housing. We increased the home ownership rate we added 15,000 new homeowners. Fourth, jobs on a comprehensive basis. We built tourism. I brought the Essence Festival to New Orleans, two Super Bowls to New Orleans. The uh, 
Super Bowl, Sugar Bowl became the college football championship game twice, uh, the Satchmo Fest, Jazz Land, the Navy Technology Park at the University of New Orleans, relocated the Hornets basketball team from Charlotte to New Orleans after building a downtown arena. We had an enormous uh, success. Uh, I have no regrets whatsoever. Uh, if there's an issue I wish I could have impacted, it would have been schools and education. But the mayor has no control whatsoever over schools and education in New Orleans. It's a separate entity. So in a sense, you sort of pretend that you could do something about it. But I wish I had figured out a way, I would, because I think that the, the key to most cities, I think the two most important functions of local government are education and public safety. You, like your father, tried to change the two amend the charter so that you could have a third term. Mm -hmm. What did you want may to do not have third been, term? May not have been the best decision by me to pursue that. Uh, I liked the job. And I frankly thought I was on a, on a roll and had momentum and I thought I could do better than anyone else. Not that I was indispensable, so I said, let me do one more term. I'm 42 years old, 43 years old. I'm still young enough. Uh, I still think I have a lot to contribute. Uh, I was defeated. It was a risk. It was a gamble. It was like a 59-yard field goal try. You know, it was uh, like a half-court jump shot. So do you was, think you build on your build on your father's legacy? Did you add it? Did you finish anything that he had started? I think he before? started police. He started police. He started police reform. With that, when he did the strike for the Mardi Gras. Yeah, he, he started police reform, and he was not able to succeed on many, many counts because he encountered a lot of resistance from entrenched interests in the police department. And at some point, he may have gave up on really, really changing the police department. Uh, I think I picked up that ball eight years later and made it happen. Uh, I think that... Uh, he had a great record on economic development. Uh, a lot of the new buildings downtown, the Riverwalk, New Orleans Center, a uh, good bit of, good deal of things, a good, a good deal of important projects took place. Uh, and I think I continued the legacy of pursuing large, large scale projects, which a mayor has to do that complex to put together. On your watch, the, didn't Hurricane Andrew? Hurricane uh, Was it Andrew or? George's took place. Uh, I was the first mayor to have to evacuate the city. We did it successfully. How we, did you do it? Uh, we had a good plan. We did it by working with the state government, with FEMA, and with the surrounding parishes. We did it by uh, uh, Starting early, uh, 48 hours out, not equivocating or waiting before we ordered the evacuation. We did it uh, by opening the dome and the convention center as shelters of last resort and providing food, water, and medical supplies at those facilities, which was a fundamental failure in Hurricane Katrina. People with no food, people with no water, people with no medical supplies for days. It's a humanitarian outrage uh, for that to have happened. It didn't need to happen that way. Even though... Okay, uh, I want you to Hurricane, give some blame to people. Hurricane George is... Well, I, I'm, you know, I'm or, very... Or just... I mean, I'm, let me been, tell you something. Okay. I, I believe... If you had been doing the job, what would have been done differently? I would have ordered the evacuation earlier, no question. I would have figured out a way to have food and water. I would have demanded that the National Guard mobilize in the city before the hurricane hit. I got them there beforehand to provide anything needed. If they weren't there beforehand, I would have asked the president and FEMA to immediately helicopter them in. I would have got food, water. No one could have stopped the bust of the levees. The question is, how did you respond? The question is, what did you do? That's the question. And uh, I'm not going to suggest that if I had been there, uh, quote, all would have been great, 
all would have been saved. But what I saw is inaction. I saw a lack of compassion. I saw a failure of leadership, a perfect storm. Federal officials, state officials, local officials, basically neglecting, equivocating, waiting, pointing fingers. Uh, it uh, is one of the great crises and tragedies in American history. Do you feel the city can be rebuilt? The city can be rebuilt, but it's long and hard and tough. 20 years? 30 years? At least. It may never be like the old New Orleans we love. It may never be. People have been displaced. Uh, many neighborhoods uh, are, f are fighting for their very survival. Uh, but the will of the people, the people who love New Orleans are determined to see it rebuilt. The question is, what will it look like and what will it be like? Why did it appear to us that there are so many poor people? There are, but uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that they saw it concentrated for the first time. New Orleans has a high rate of poverty. But so does Cleveland, so does St. Louis, so does New York City, so does Philadelphia, so does Baltimore, so does uh, Atlanta, so does Oakland. But you saw it. Let no, people shouldn't pretend that the poverty they saw was just a New Orleans thing. And then again, if you take people and they're running from their homes with no clothing, and they spend a day and a half with no facilities to use, no grooming, no change of clothes, everybody's going to look bad. Everybody's going to look bad. There is a lot of poverty in New Orleans, no doubt. Uh, so when you walked into the stadium, the, where, was it the dome or the The stadium? dome, the dome, the dome. Uh, when in Georgia's or in? No, the, the, didn't you, did you go to the one in New Orleans? No, I didn't go down didn't go during, during the storm. Okay, I saw some pictures of you at the one. And I couldn't that was at the one. Astrodome. Okay. I went to Houston a week after the storm where the people had been evacuated to to go see my old constituents and to go just try to comfort people. And your reception? I, was, I was felt very well received. I mean, it was, it was heartwarming uh, for people to, people just wanted someone to come see them. You know, Bill Clinton came that same day, Barack Obama came that same day. Uh, well, being George that, Bush, the father, came that same day. What do you feel your responsibility is now? To, to do whatever I can from my position as president of the National Urban League to affect public policy and so that our efforts in the Gulf Coast, mainly uh, our efforts to, uh, through our affiliate. We have job training programs, financial literacy programs are as effective as they can be. So just to backtrack a little bit, the stadium in New Orleans, was it the stadium in New Orleans that was named, or the convention center that was named? Convention center named after my father, the Ernest and Morial Convention Center, which was one of the triumphs of his administration. Uh, he built phase one and started on phase two, and under my administration we built phase three. Uh, and it was named after him in 1992. We're going to change tapes? Mm-hmm. Take a quick break. Go to the to your job as mayor, you know, the first term. Uh, at the end of the first term, your decision to go for a second term, you knew you'd win? Uh, it was, yeah, it was an easy decision, and we had a historic re-election, got 80% of the vote. 
Who did you run against the first time? Uh, Donald, Donald Mintz. Mintz. Donald Mintz. Who Donald died? Mintz died in 1996. He was a a uh, prominent lawyer. He worked for uh, the and, defamation uh, league. He worked for he he was a civic activist, uh, and he uh, was a founding partner of a law firm, the McGlinchey Law Firm, and he was uh, a tough opponent. A resourceful candidate, a, a smart guy. Uh, we had a very, very hard fought. It was like Ali Frazier. Uh, it was one, one, one battle, one historic battle um, for the big ring in New Orleans. And we were able to win uh, the first time with 54, 55 percent. Did it ever get uh, like dirty between Oh, the it was a very, very hard hitting. Uh, dirty campaign by, by, by convention, but I, it was a sharp campaign uh, because he uh, utilized what I thought were inappropriate uh, tactics. He which were? Which, what basically put out these racist flyers. Uh, uh, and what made them racist? Well, this is what he did. He, you know, he, and this got revealed because one of his campaign aides got indicted uh, and charged with. Uh, putting out violating campaign laws. But what basically happened is that uh, he began, these e anonymous flyers began to emerge. Very negative flyers began to emerge on all of the African-American candidates in the African-American community. Accused one guy of being corrupt. It showed another guy in a dress. Uh, it uh, said all kind of nasty things about me and my family. And uh, all these flyers started, and they started showing up on people's doors. Very slick flyers, very negative. They tried to be somewhat humorous, but they were very negative. Donald Mintz, apparently when uh, the flyer issue became a public issue, took the position, he says, oh, I, you know, because everyone's sort of looking at each other saying, who's putting these flyers out? So everyone says, well, who didn't get any? Donald Mintz says, well, they put out flyers on me, too. The flyers on me are anti-Semitic. And so they were anti-Semitic flyers being put out on Donald Mintz. Come to find out he was distributing anti-Semitic flyers on himself. And then he, was, he took the flyers and he direct mailed them to people across the country to raise money. So this kind of got exposed. And that is a violation of... Violation of Louisiana, Louisiana law requires law. you to, at the time, required you, any campaign literature had to have a disclaimer paid for and authorized by. You couldn't put out an anonymous flyer. And um, so it got very hard hitting and I took him to task. What did you... Yeah. Basically took him to task and, and said that he was, that uh, he would, uh, do anything to get elected. That he was in effect a Nixonian figure. Did and I respected play? him, and yeah, race did play an issue. How big uh, or how small? It was a big, I mean, race has been an issue in every New Orleans election for 50 years. It's an issue. Even when you have two black candidates, it's an issue. It was an issue when you had two white candidates. In the old days, when two white candidates ran, against each other, invariably one would accuse the other of being a Negro sympathizer, an NAACP sympathizer. And it's funny, you know, back in the days, if you look at the old archives of Louisiana politics, you'd see they put out flyers on a guy showing a guy on the same, looking, look, look, making it appear as though the guy's talking to Martin Luther King. Say, so, uh, uh, Sam Jones at NAACP meeting with Martin Luther King. <laughs> I mean, those were the tactics. When black candidates uh, became, uh, we've had a few races where black candidates ran against each other, then you'd have the reverse phenomenon where you'd have uh, one candidate who run mainly as the candidate of the white community and the other who run as mainly the candidate of the black community. You can't get away. You know, a lot of people like to sweet talk, nice talk, but you know, race, 
It's not a factor. It's not the only factor. It's not uh, a, f a dominant factor in every voter's mind, but it's a dominant factor in the election. Dominant factor in my, in my re-election, it was interesting, I had token opposition. And I carried probably, I got 80% of the vote, and I carried 80% of the precincts in the city. But the 20% of the precincts I didn't carry were conservative precincts who voted for a nobody candidate over me. It was stunning. But I got 80% of the vote, which was the largest first primary victory by anybody in uh, 100 years. So when you win, you win. And when you win, you're happy. And when you win, you're glad. But, you know, post-analysis. Post and that gave me a lot of momentum. Uh, my approval rating remained at 70% the entire time I was in office. Uh, the community really stuck with me, a broad coalition. We had support in the white community, support in the black community. Uh, we had support in the business community. We had support amongst labor unions. We had broad-based support because I think we were able to articulate a common vision, public safety, jobs for the community, and let's rebuild the housing. And let's make New Orleans progress. Second term as effective as the first term? I think it was effective because, mainly because of many projects that we began to work on in the first term came to fruition. The completion of phase three of the convention center, the completion of police reform, the uh, building of the Jazzland theme park, the Navy Technology Center opened. Uh, the streetcar on Canal Street uh, came together in our second term. The major improvements at the airport. Uh, the most important thing I think we did is we got most of our big things started in the first term. Not everything. And they came to fruition. But second terms, you don't, it's hard to maintain the continuous excitement. It's hard to maintain that on an ongoing basis. So I noticed, you know, probably my last year in office, a little of the enthusiasm. People began to have a great sense that uh, success is automatic, you know, that uh, you lose a little momentum. People start moving away from you when you get to the end. It's just a natural occurrence. You see it with presidents, you see it with governors, you see it with mayors. But at the end of the day, the final poll I took just a few months before I left office, I had a 70% approval rating. Uh, you know, I, I, I have great satisfaction. How did you get the Hornet to leave Charlotte? That was teamwork. I had the, gov the governor, and the governor at the time and I uh, were really on the same page. And he was willing, because the state owned the arena and had the incentives to give the team. We pursued it doggedly. I mean, we had gone after the Minnesota Timberwolves my first year in office. That was completely unsuccessful. We went after the Vancouver Grizzlies, and they ended up in Memphis. And then when I was in, at six months ago in office, uh, Doug Thornton, who ran the arena and the dome, called me up and said, I got to come see you. He said, I think we got a shot at another team. And I remember saying, Doug, come on, man. Really? He said, I think we can make this one happen. I said, you know, I'm 100%. Let's go do it. Let's go, let's go see if we can do it. So we worked on it, and it happened. And we had a historic coalition. Uh, and one of the keys was we had a building, a first-class arena, with no debt that no one had a major lease to that was available to the team. Secondly, the team absolutely, the owners of the team absolutely were going to leave Carolina. Uh, they had uh, been unsuccessful in getting a referendum to build a new stadium passed. The owner up there, one of the owners up there, had run into some public relations issues. And then the second owner, Ray Woolridge, who was a businessman from Georgia, part owner of the team, really drove. He loved New Orleans. He still lives in New Orleans. Even post Katrina, he loved the city. Uh, he really drove the decision to New Orleans. It was a great success, and I'm, I'm a sports guy. I'm a basket, played basketball, played football. I, as a boy, went 
to the New Orleans Buccaneers games, New Orleans Buccaneers, the old ABA team. I remember, you know, going to see Connie Hawkins, going to see, uh, you know, all those great ABA greats, you know, uh, Larry Brown, I remember, who was a famous coach, was a player back in those days. Uh, Cliff Hagen, um, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the great, uh, Jimmy Jones, Steve Jones. I remember as a boy going to bat, I just, you know, I think a lot of us felt New Orleans is a big league sports town. We ought to have a basketball team. So it was uh, teamwork. I think it was perseverance because we had gone after teams before. And uh, I think it was a little bit of lady luck, which counts. <laughs> so after September 11th, you were able to successfully negotiate to push everything. What did you do? Was well, let me just say this. One point that we probably haven't talked about is my involvement with the United States Conference of Mayors, uh, which was a great part, an important part. I got to be president of the Conference of Mayors. My father had been president of the Conference of Mayors. Only the Morials and the Dailies are the two father and son teams who had been, who'd been president of the Conference of Mayors. and. I got involved with the conference my first year, uh, and the, being involved in the conference gave me an opportunity to put New Orleans in the national spotlight a little bit, gave me an opportunity to be involved in national issues. And when 9-11 took place, I was actually the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors and got an opportunity to work with the city of New York and uh, Mayor Giuliani and uh, mayors across the country in doing something about the security issues. We federalized airport security. We pushed for the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and a whole range of things like that. Um, so uh, the Conference of Mayors was, uh, was a very important uh, part of my uh, I really enjoyed being president. I really learned a lot and met a great network of friends and people uh, and felt like we had impact because the, the Conference of Mayors was a bipartisan organization. Where Republicans and Democratic mayors could work together. So, of that conference of mayors, you got to see all of the black mayors from other big cities. Got a chance to see all the mayors of uh, black and white, uh, all the mayors, Hispanic and Asian, all the mayors, because uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors is the big, multi-partisan, multi-racial. Got a chance to meet so many. Great Norm Rice, Wellington Webb, uh, Ed Rendell, Willie Brown, uh, uh, Tony Williams, uh, Tommy Menino, Paul Helmke, Richard Daly, Dennis Archer, Ron Kirk, Bill What's Campbell. What's the gentleman's name in D.C.? Barry, Marion Barry. Marion Barry, but of course I've known Marion Barry because Marion Barry was a contemporary of my dad's. And they were friends in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so I've known Mayor Barry for many, many, many years. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so many great colleagues, Sharon Sales Belton, the mayor of uh, Minneapolis, she ha happened to be, former mayor of Minneapolis, happened to be here in our office today because uh, she's doing some work now with the Homeownership Preservation Foundation. So it, you know, we had, a, we had an incredible group of mayors in the, seven, in the, in the 90s, rather, incredible group of mayors. Who, uh, we saved this community development block grant program. We saved uh, NEA. We got the welfare to work legislation on the books. We, not welfare reform, but welfare to work. Uh, we uh, we uh, we were got the community oriented policing passed. We were a force. So, do you think uh, Clinton's uh, presidency had anything to do with? The way things are running. Yeah, I do. I think Clinton was a great president. I think Clinton became a great president. I think Clinton, his first year or two, uh, was he had struggles, uh, but when he focused, and when he really developed a partnership with the mayors, is it really when he flowered. He was Bill Clinton's an incredibly bright guy, uh, incredibly engaging guy, and uh, and I think a creative leader and. Uh, had a lot of appeal, and I think he will go down as one of the great presidents uh, of the last 50 years. When people will take a look at his accomplishments, you know, 
balancing the budget, creating a surplus, strengthening the economy, the empowerment zone program, uh, so many things. Did you have any idea what you would do after leaving? No, I left, I left office. I needed a job. I had a baby. I had a one-month-old. I uh, was term limited, uh, and I, I, I wanted to go in the private sector. Well, let me ask you this. Was it a crushing defeat not to No. I, let me tell you something. I knew we weren't going to win. Uh, I, after 9-11, particularly, the election took place in October. I knew we were going to be unsuccessful uh, because it just people's folk were not focused on the referendum. Uh, and it, it was not a crushing defeat. Uh, and uh, I immediately began to think about what I would do. And I got an opportunity through a, a great friendship with a lawyer by the name of Sam LeBlanc to have an opportunity to join a great law firm, Adams & Reese. Great New Orleans law firm, great uh, Louisiana institution, great group of lawyers uh, uh, doing important things, building a regional law firm. And I spent uh, a year there and I uh, enjoyed it. And, uh, uh, it was uh, a chance to transition, and uh, that's interesting. A chance to transition. Yeah, and I figured when I joined the firm that I'd be there three to five years. I had no idea, no eye, no thought, no notion of looking for another job. I wanted to build a law practice, uh, and lo and behold, the opportunity to interview for presidency of the league, the National Urban League, came up. How did that come up? I mean, there I got a call from, candidates. they must have been, I, you know, I got a call from someone I know who said, you know, the presidency of the National Urban League is up. Oh, said, you ought to go after that. I said, well, how do you go after that? He said, it's not really a job you apply for, is it? He said, well, I'm going to call somebody who's on the search committee and tell them they ought to take a look at you. I said, well, go ahead. Thinking really nothing of it thinking, oh, you know, it's be interesting, but don't hold your breath. Uh, lo and behold, a couple of months later, I get a call from uh, the chairman of the search committee who says, you know, your name's been given to us. Uh, do you think you could come to New York and interview with us? I said, fine. How do you even interview for a job like this? You really... It's really hard to interview for a job like that because it's really a conversation. So I, I flew up. i never forget the first interview was the same day of the Final Four in uh, 2003. Same exact day of the Final Four. And uh, it was also the, uh, the day of my son's first birthday which is good luck. So we, we had to, knew we were going up, we had to hold his birthday party the day before. And uh, on April the 6th, and I flew up and came to New York and went to a law office in Midtown and interviewed with four or five people. And it was just a delightful and interesting, I mean, it was an interesting conversation. Uh, Can you tell me anything about the conversation? I mean, I don't remember tons about the except it was a conversation about me and about the league and about civil rights and about vision. It was that kind of conversation. And as I left, they said, well, we will probably be in touch with you to invite you back. I said, well, that's a good sign. I didn't hear from them. They called me back and said, can you come up you know, this Saturday? Uh, so I said, fine, we meet with the whole search committee. So I go back to the same law office thinking I'm going to be meeting with about 10 people or five people or seven people. I walk into the room, it's about 20 people. I'm like, whoa. Interviewed for about two hours. Felt like I did okay. I, you know, these interviews make you nervous. They're tough and a lot of good questions, a lot of engagement. What kind of questions do they ask them? You know, I mean, they questions everything from why do you want this job and what could you do for us and, and what do you I mean, think? Of, what do you think about you, our organization? Yeah, you say and you said, well, because you think you can, you think you can uh, provide direction and leadership that uh, 
it's consistent with your commitment to equal justice and uh, public policy that uh, the tremendous personalities, the Vernon Jordans and the Whitney Youngs who've held this position uh, are role models of mine. Um, and after all, there have only been eight presidents and in almost 100 years. There have been 17 U.S. presidents. So lo and behold, I interview with this big group of folks, and it's a wonderful interview. I rush to LaGuardia, I fly back to New Orleans, and uh, I get back, my wife says, how'd it go, how'd it go? I said, I thought it did good. She said, they're gonna call you tomorrow. On a Sunday? Exactly, that's exactly what I said. I said, hey, ain't nobody's calling. I said, Michelle, nobody's calling me on a Sunday about a job. Truth of the matter is, uh, early Sunday morning, about 9.30, the phone rings, and you know, the phone doesn't ring on Sunday morning unless it's my mama calling or my daughter calling. And my wife answers the phone, and she picks up the phone, she says, I think she's joking me. So I pick up the phone, it's the chair of the search committee. He says, well, this is it. We want to talk to you about becoming the next president of the league. And the rest. Well, what do you do? You drop the rest is history. Yeah, I mean, it was a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fall to the knees. You said, wow. But then they said, wow, we want you to start right away. And of course, my involvement, excuse me, in the process had been completely confidential because I had a job and I had a job with a group of people I respected and liked and an opportunity and here I was less than a year later and I'm going to pick up and leave. But here it is, it's the job you can't say no to. And that I'm sure they understood. They understood it, they were disappointed, but they certainly understood it. This job, in a lot of ways, definitely has more uh, prestige, possibly, than, or, I mean, what, well, what are the differences? Well, it's between? a national post. It's the nonprofit world versus government. It's got the sort of sterling history of being one of the nation's historic civil rights organizations, but it's a smaller organization. You know, you run a city in New Orleans, uh, which, with its outside agencies, uh, is close to a billion dollar operation uh, where you, uh, you're you running a very complex organization to running a, 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 an organization which by nonprofit standards is a nice size but by the, but in comparison to a large government agency or a large private sector company it's relatively small so one of the challenges you face in this kind of work is the necessity to focus your energies and focus your efforts because you can't do everything. You know, you have uh, limited staff, you have uh, an affiliate network, which is great, but I mean, you're community-based. You're a network of community-based organizations. You are a, you know, incredibly, uh, you know, uh, you have an incredible brand of history. And you have a, it's a, the, the, the job and the cashier of the organization is a door opener. It's a door opener into the business community. It's a door opener into the political community. It's a door opener into civil rights. Uh, so in that sense, the job has a level of prestige and a level of, you know, there are only a handful of national civil rights organizations. You know, six, seven, national not 10, not 20, not 30, not 40. So in that sense, you're in an exclusive sort of a uh, club. And then you've also got here the, just the history of the place. You see the, the people, the involvement. It's a great deal of responsibility, but you know, being mayor, uh, I feel, uh, prepared 
is preparation for wanting to do anything. If you can run a city, you can run anything. Mainly because... Can you run a country? I'm going to go ahead, mainly because... The pressure. What you do as mayor is you make decisions with pressure. There are very few decisions that you have the luxury of long, thoughtful deliberation. You know, you do on some, but usually you're pressure tested every single day. So I've learned to, you know, in this job, I don't have to make every decision right away. But I try to move things, because moving things fast, and the transformation of this organization means moving faster and picking up the pace, the pace of change, the pace of transformation. What are the challenges? Here? Raising money. Uh, raising the money and assembling the resources you need to do everything you need. The problems are massive. The social and economic problems that face the urban community and that face black America are significant. They're massive. 25% uh, poverty rate, a high unemployment, high high school dropout, myriad of difficult social problems. The problems are massive. The problems are far beyond the ability of any single community-based organization to solve them all. And that's what's tough. And that's what's challenging. So it boils, it boils down to money, having enough money. Well, it boils down to not only money, but resources are important. Now, resources and vision and the ability to lead and mobilize people. But if you ask, you know, the great challenge is to have the resources you need. I mean, from where I sit, my job is, uh, in large measure, a resource development job. Money, people, support, vision and direction. That's the job. What are the rewarding parts of the job? I've always been satisfied by seeing things that you work on come to fruition the new programs, um, the changed lives. Those things have had just a tremendous impact. Give me a great joy, great satisfaction. The, the, the idea that we can take a historic organization and transform it, prepare it, uh, make it relevant for the 21st century. Um, but really ultimately in changing people's lives. That's where the joy is. So let me ask you this. We, uh, you talked about 25% poverty in the education. Like how do you go about, or how, yeah, how do you go about changing those things? You've got to work directly with people in communities. Well, when you came here, you said you had a five-prong uh, approach to we have a five-pronged approach, education, economic empowerment, health and quality of life, civic engagement, and civil rights. Of the five, the lead horse for us is economics, uh, job training, housing, financial literacy, entrepreneurship, and business development is a lead horse. It all leads to that. Education is about preparing people to be fully productive citizens, fundamentally. Wrap it all up. So you were the man from Uncle. <laughs> the man from the man from Uncle. <laughs> so you need a PR agent. Yes. When you when you look back over what you've been able to accomplish so far, what stands out most for you? The ability to work on things I love and to get paid to do it. To 
feel that I've been able to use the talents that God gave me and the values that my parents instilled in me and a sense of the times that I am blessed to live in to try to make a difference in people's lives. Uh, everything that I've had an opportunity to do professionally, uh, I never had a plan. I never had a master plan. I didn't approach my career in that fashion. I did things that I thought were interesting. I did things that I thought were challenging. Uh, I think uh, the toughest assignment I've had was serving as mayor. Uh, ultimately, uh, that job is definitional in my career, but rewarding has been the chance to be president of the Conference of Mayors and the president of the National Urban League. And since I'm only three years in, you have to come back and talk to me in another five, six years to really get a sense. But the reason why I say rewarding is because it's a chance to operate on a national level and to impact communities from coast to coast. But there's perhaps nothing more special uh, than uh, playing a leadership role in your own hometown where you know the people, where your DNA, your history is rooted. And that's what being mayor was for me. How has New York been for you? Uh, this has been uh, an experience of learning, an experience of discovery, an experience of connecting with old friends and making new relationships. Uh, it's been uh, an energizing experience. Uh, New York is the center of the universe. Uh, it's a place of so many and varied things. There's all sorts of business and economics here. There's all sorts of politics here. There's world affairs. There's a myriad of communities. There's a powerful African-American community, a Caribbean-American community, all sorts of European-American communities, a Latino community. Uh, it's uh, interesting to be a New Yorker now because as a visitor to the city over my entire life, I very seldom ever left Manhattan. I think I'd been to Brooklyn once, uh, had only been to Queens to go to the airports, had never really been to the Bronx, never been to Staten Island. And you realize New York is huge, that it's almost a nation unto itself, a republic, if you will, if you look at Metro New York. What are your hopes for the black community, the African? I hope for the black community economic self-sufficiency, economic independence, economic, uh, and I also hope for the black community that uh, we can achieve full and equal justice and our rightful place in American society, uh, which we are a ways off from. Uh, but uh, so much of what I think is if we achieve economic parity, I think that many of the social and economic problems are symptomatic of the lack of economic parity. They will not go away, but I think if we had economic parity, many problems would dissipate and reduce. So this will be the last question. Um, you, you're not a man who said you, you, haven't, you, you didn't have a plan. You didn't, your career hasn't been a plan. It's all simply fallen into place. If you've been where you needed to be to receive what you needed to receive. Being at this place in your life, and the tenure for this job on average is what, eight years? 10 years, Ten years. eight today. So you're three years in. Seven years from now, you'll still, still be a very young man. What do you see yourself doing? I'm gonna follow my passions. Because while I haven't had a plan, I've followed my passions. 
I followed my passions, I followed my interest. And I think I followed the guidance of God. I mean, when I say that, I mean, it's the silent uh, sort of beaten voice which directs you and guides you. Uh, I want to simply be able to continue to contribute uh, throughout my life uh, and contribute to be a change agent, continue to make a difference. That's my hope for myself and, and to continue to be one who uh, puts his family and his community first. I didn't even, I forgot to talk about your wife. Oh, Michelle. When, my, what wife, year did my, you wife, my wife and I are married on September 11, 1999. We started going out in 1995. Uh, my wife has been a wonderful supporter and partner. partner. And she herself is a journalist. She's a journalist and a very accomplished woman in her own right. And is she working with CBS? She works with CBS News now here in New York in the Northeast Bureau. We have two beautiful children, Mason, who's four and a half, and Margot, who's almost one. And then I have an older daughter, Kimma, who's 24 and a graduate of Tufts University. So we have a great family. And uh, uh, my wife is uh, a confidant and an advisor. She is uh, enormously talented, and she's been a very important part of my life the last 10 years. Well, we thank you very much. Appreciate you all. And let me thank you all for your patience. Appreciate that. Oh, it, and, it goes uh, I hope saying. this turns out okay. It's, this is awesome. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. The man from Uncle. He's <laughs> Shaq. Uh, Shaq, the man from Uncle, huh? <laughs> So, now, you know, actually, the man from Uncle was actually two guys. You remember? Oh, that? is he? Yeah, no, I, re I remember, but I. I